Hi, and thanks for making the time to join us from wherever or whenever you might be watching this webinar. My name is Darren Bryce and an account manager for Esri, focused on business development within our mining sector and patching in from cold and snowy Guelph, Ontario, here in Canada. I will serve as your MC for this second of a two-part webinar series on geospatial strategies for tailing storage facility management. Uh, note, while it was not a prerequisite, I encourage you, if you have not already, to watch part one of this series, which is one of our highest consumed webinars to date, with over 49 different country, countries represented. This webinar was organized in collaboration with the Esri Mining User Group. And a recording of this webinar will be posted on YouTube and a link shared with all registrants. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to ask questions through the GoToWebinar question dialog box, and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. In addition to myself, I'm joined today by my two colleagues, Matt Ballard, who's a solution engineer on the Natural Resources team, and Caroline Tierra, who's an account executive on our remote sensing and imagery team here at Edgecreek. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and say a few quick words about the Esri Mining User Group. The MUG serves several purposes. First, it acts as a professional networking organization focused on geospatial professionals in the mining industry. Esri is very committed to understanding what's important to our mining customers, and the MUG acts as our community outreach site. It's how Esri gains feedback from our users. The MUG also works to coordinate seminars and networking events at mining conferences and facilitates webinars such as the one we're watching today. These webinars are designed to document and demonstrate mining workflows which leverage geospatial technology. The MUG has been in existence for about 12 years. It's made up of more than 2,000 members. The membership is managed on LinkedIn, and I strongly encourage you to join the community or make the colleagues or make your colleagues and peers aware of this group. So now a quick rundown of the agenda. I'll start with providing some context of the what. What is TSF management and how is this critical to not just the mining sector, but the communities and environments that they operate within? And the why of how this needs to be part of any resource development plan and how this closely aligns with Edry's underpinning ethos of sustainable development in all of the industries we support. From there, we'll get into a high level overview from Caroline on the part that imagery and remote sensing plays in the management and operational efficiency at tailing storage facilities. And then Matt will take us through some of the ArcGIS technology and services supporting TSF. Finally, we'll wrap up with a Q&A session. So again, please be sure and submit your questions and we'll do our best to get to them in the time we have. When it comes to tailings, the risk and consequences are very clear, given some of the notable disasters and the late. Being some of the largest engineered structures in the world, holding trillions of tons of historic and new tailings, the potential environmental risk and liability on mining companies and the public is all too obvious. Going forward, the reality of lower grade deposits being mined inherently produces larger volume of tailings, which in turn compounds the problem facing mining companies and the communities in which they operate. After attending the AME Roundup virtually last week, it was even further apparent the emphasis and pressure on our industry to improve in all aspects of environmental, social, and governance policies, or simply ESGs. Every talk and presentation I sat in on was underpinned by the critical importance of ESG compliance, auditing, and components of what this is going to mean to our industry going forward. And this will continue to tighten with shareholders and investors insistent on transparency and adherence of explorers and mining companies to up their game in the communities and districts they are operating in around the world. The emphasis around ESGs dovetails nicely into Edry's own sustainable prosperity approach to GIS. Anyone that will have attended our virtual UC last year would have heard Jack Dangerman, Edry's president, talk at length about sustainable prosperity. He defines sustainable prosperity as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the future. Today, successful organizations are realizing that there are three critical elements needed to create sustainable prosperity, which is economic, social, and environmental. Economic prosperity is meaning creating positive financial results. Social prosperity 
meaning doing good for the people. And environmental prosperity is considering the responsible impact on our planet. GIS technology can help organizations achieve their goals with regards to these tenets, but it requires more than just technology. It requires intelligent action, good values, ethics, and ultimately pure hard work. Essentially, it requires you to understand and apply the technology in a balanced way. So if we think of sustainable prosperity in the context of TSF management, we can look at it this way. The probability of risk may be small, but the potential impacts are enormous for environmental, social, and economic reasons. Therefore, an enterprise approach that includes geospatial considerations can help ensure TSF compliance, confirm stability of structures, and assist in emergency planning, thus positioning an organization to proactively respond to issues and communicate with applicable stakeholders, both internally and externally. So now let's have a quick look at uh, the ArcGIS suite of technology applicable to TSF. The five capabilities on screen are not exhaustive, but represent the keys to Esri's approach. The first three, field mobility, imagery and remote sensing, and real-time and IoT are important to measuring, visualizing, and analyzing the information on the ground. Equally important is providing easy access through a system of engagement catered and scaled to the requirements of both internal and external stakeholders through ESI suite of ArcGIS applications and services, including dashboards of that dynamically changing data and information. As mentioned, the field mobility and real-time and IoT capabilities were showcased in the previous webinar. And now I'll hand it across to Caroline, who will provide a high-level overview and the focus of this webinar being on imagery and remote sensing in its critical role in TSF management. Caroline? Thank you, Darren. As many of you are aware, remote sensing has been used for years to explore for minerals and to map geological characteristics. Recent industry advances in cameras and other sensors have increased the spatial and spectral resolution of this data, and along with improved radiometric accuracies and new image processing techniques, there are now more opportunities to streamline exploration efforts and improve environmental assessments. Less well known is the applicability to tailings management systems, where useful surveillance techniques can provide transparency into your operations. Pushing this visual input into your management system requires a powerful information platform. So first I'll touch on how ArcGIS provides a complete remote sensing and imagery solution. Esri's imagery architecture runs from desktop to server with many different ways to process, manage, and utilize imagery in between. It's all about providing you ways to work with imagery within your GIS. It starts with Pro, which has many imagery capabilities built in and is in some cases all that is needed by some of our users. But for those of you with large data collections or those of you wanting to do more with your imagery, Pro is an access point for publishing imagery to the server, and creating imagery services, allowing you to scale your imagery operations. Within the platform, photogrammetric tools are available to make those sources accurate and authoritative for use within your GIS. And analytics can be run at scale to extract features from the imagery and to do all types of advanced analysis. Users can access all this content using powerful imagery-based web applications, such as operations dashboards. All of this leads to better decision-making by those both familiar with imagery in GIS and those who are not. This is what we mean when we say that ArcGIS is a comprehensive imagery platform. It's important to note that the proliferation of new data sources and techniques I mentioned a moment ago requires an agnostic system that can utilize the many different sensor and file types available today. Esri software works with all types of image files taken from all types of different sensors. Aerial, satellite, and drones are all producing relevant up-to-date content that you can use to improve the capabilities of your GIS. We support over 60 different sensors and over 100 native image formats, and we're continuously updating the system as new sources of imagery become available. ArcGIS brings this remotely sensed content together through an abstraction layer to create a common language of maps and 3D scenes and fundamental layers of features. These can be mashed up and integrated dynamically. 
We know that GIS already provides a modern framework for managing all types of geospatial information, and it can do the same for remotely sensed content. The platform is optimized to work with disparate data sets all in one place. From there, you can leverage a number of tools to manage your imagery, create products with photogrammetry, work with artificial intelligence models trained by imagery, and use geoprocessing and raster analytic tool sets, all of which provide ways to map the world in 2D and 3D, perform visual analysis, and find spatial patterns. Let's break this down and look at the power of the imagery platform, more specifically in terms of mine tailings monitoring. As mentioned, the ArcGIS imagery platform provides a collaborative workspace to import, process, visualize, and share imagery content. It allows you to combine multimodal imagery from satellite, manned and unmanned aerial platforms, in situ instrumentation, radar, LIDAR, and other sensors, all in one place. The platform itself allows you to apply sophisticated photogrammetric, geoprocessing, and raster function tools to all these diverse data sets and provides a way to then publish and share derivative information products. From there, your organization can share and publish imagery services or use web apps such as story maps or an operations dashboard to visualize all of these combined data sets. Matt will show this later in the presentation. These visualization tools provide a common operating picture, a comprehensive overview of the status of your dams and surrounding areas, and the ability to view metrics such as, such as piezometric pressures or inclinometer readings all of the information relevant to your operations in one place. Or you can go further, performing more advanced analysis, finding spatial patterns, or conducting deformation studies, hydrological modeling, and environmental assessments. Analytics can be set to run at scale to extract features from the imagery and do all types of advanced analysis using image classification wizard or by classifying pixels using deep learning tools. The platform provides many ways to support and enhance decision making by providing an ongoing audit of your operation. So from the sensor all the way to accurate derived information products, the ArcGIS imagery, imagery platform provides all the tools necessary to work with remotely sensed data and to customize your workflows and audit your tailings facility operations. Here are just a few examples of the many ways you can interact with and analyze your imagery data. All of these pixels take up space, and one of our focus areas over the last year has been improving the management and storage of your imagery data. As part of ArcGIS Enterprise, Image Server powers the analytical processing and serving of large collections of imagery, elevation data, and rasters. Soon, as we will be introducing ArcGIS Online Image Services, which provides software as a service based options for managing and storing your data, including options for processing and analysis in the cloud. ArcGIS Image Server is not going anywhere, though, and remains a powerful way to host, manage, and analyze your data. It's really a matter of what works best for you. This new offering will allow users to host, serve, and analyze their imagery collections within ArcGIS Online. There are several options, including basic imagery storage for those that don't need to interact with their pixels. The tiled imagery option provides capabilities to project and render your projects as required, with full bit depth, band registration, and fast rendering. And the dynamic imagery option is feature-rich, providing on-the-fly processing and dynamic mosaicing. Further, sophisticated image analysis capabilities include image classification and AIML tools, as well as the ability to generate new derived information products, such as slope analysis, vegetation masks, and feature extraction. ArcGIS Enterprise is not required as it is with Image Server. Later in the webinar, Matt will be providing a demonstration of these new services. As well, Matt will be calling up some imagery from Esri's Living Atlas of the World. We encourage you to explore the rich content provided through the portal with authoritative data layers that can feed into the imagery platform capabilities I've just highlighted. 
ESRI's Living Atlas portal is fed by leading data providers with raster tile base maps, elevation, and global imagery, high resolution data, and metadata updated frequently. ESRI is proud to be partners with leading satellite and aerial imagery providers, and our offering includes direct sale of imagery products on behalf of several of these partners. More on that in a moment. So now you have an idea of the powerful imagery capabilities available from ESRI. Matt will now show just a few of the many ways the ArcGIS imagery platform supports the critical needs Darren mentioned around your tailings operations. Matt? All right, thanks, Caroline. Go ahead and share my screen here. So I'm gonna be walking through a couple of workflows to show you how ArcGIS can help with managing tailings facilities using remote sensing. As Caroline presented, ArcGIS is a platform for imagery content, analysis, management, and sharing. And so I'd like to walk through each of those key capabilities and really show you how to apply them to tailings management, ultimately to, enha to enhance your monitoring operations and reduce risk. First though, let's look through how imagery fits into the bigger picture of tailings monitoring with ArcGIS. Here on this dashboard, we can see some of the geospatial methods that Darren mentioned earlier that can be used to help reduce risk. Daily mobile inspections performed in the field can be reported back to the office and visualized on this dashboard, where we can see their locations, their associated severity, whether acceptable, high risk, low risk, or moderate risk, as well as data that was captured in the field, in this case, just pictures. We covered this topic in the last webinar, which was recorded if you'd like to see a little bit more about it. Secondly, in situ sensors, such as piezometers, can also be used to remotely monitor. Uh, those sensor locations can be visualized quickly on a map as they are here. And I can select from them using these selection tools to quickly create time series charts that show me historical values. ArcGIS provides ways for you to integrate with your already in place sensor networks and platforms, not replacing them, but integrating with those systems. And by visualizing them on a map, you can explore how they might be correlated with for example, those inspections in the pictures, uh, as well as how co-located sensors are behaving. Now, visual inspections and in-situ monitoring devices are really great tools, but incomplete without the addition of remote sensing, whether that's from satellites, drones, uh, aircraft, or even drone-based, uh, or even ground-based devices. As a fairly simple example, I can see a recent imagery base map here in the background. Right, this gives me context for all of my other data that you simply can't get with spreadsheets and PDF documents. But imagery goes much, much further than just being a base map. So let's go look at some of the content that Esri makes avail available for you to get started with remote sensing workflows. Esri makes data readily available for you through the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the world. The Living Atlas is the foremost collection of geographic information from around the globe. And it includes maps, apps, and data layers that can support the entire mining life cycle from exploration to reclamation. To explore the Living Atlas, I can browse in different categories, such as boundaries, people, infrastructure, and environment. And under, an environment, under environment, I could find, uh, for example, information about the World Database of Protected Areas for siting and planning projects. I could also find information like live weather feeds for radar, or I could find information for recent seismic activity. All of these layers that I pull from the Living Atlas can quickly be added to web maps for visualization and analysis. Here, each of those earthquake locations, for example, are visible. I can click on them to get more details. Now, for today, though, really we're interested in primarily imagery available that's available in the Living Atlas. Here, Esri manages data from NAEP in the United States, Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, and much, much more. To start working with this data, for example, I can open up our Sentinel Explorer. This is an out-of-the-box application for exploring and analyzing Sentinel imagery. I'll start off by searching at the top right for my area of interest, which is Salarita, Arizona. And it'll zoom me right to the location where uh, my where this tailing stand is. 
Sentinel-2 carries an optical instrument that observes 13 spectral bands. And we can use the RGB bands within this to render it as a natural color, which is what we see on the map. Using those other bands, though, we can also dynamically change this imagery, for example, using the geology render. Uh, and for exploration purposes, this could be helpful for highlighting certain spectral signatures associated with certain minerals. When it comes to tailings management, though, uh, managing water is critical. And so we can use the Normalized Difference Moisture Index, or NDMI, to understand water content on this tailing storage facility, which is now highlighted in blue. Going back to the natural color image, I can also start to explore data over time. So the image that we're looking at right now is from January 9th, but I also have access to historical data because the Living Atlas is constantly being updated. So if I wanted to compare to December 5th, for example, uh, to the most recent imagery from January 9th, I can now use the slider tool to see how things have changed. I can clearly see new material that's been deposited to the northwest. And I can see how the pond outline here has changed between these two dates. In this application, I've also got a masking tool that I'll show you. This masking tool allows you to apply different indices to your data, such as vegetation indexes, development indexes, water indexes, and much more to essentially pull out areas of interest. So I'm gonna zoom down to an area that's undergoing reclamation at this point, and we'll look at this vegetation index that'll highlight where vegetation has taken place. So using this mask, I can understand where vegetation has um, started to take hold on this reclamation project. Going back up to the tailings facility though, I can use our water index, which will delineate the pond outline uh, here in a second. All of this analysis that's occurring in this application is um, dynamically being done in the browser. It's rapid and iterative for those users who want to work with the data in a browser. And they even have the ability to add data coming from their authoritative organizational data. So if I search, for example, for crest distances, I can add a layer that somebody else manages that shows me um, 100 meter intervals in distance from the crest here. So 300, 200, and 100 meters. And each of these have different associated trigger action response plans that we can use um, to make more informed decisions. And finally, this map that I've created in the analysis can be shared as a layer that can be included in reports or dashboards such as the one that we looked at before. So to summarize this first thing that we've looked at, ArcGIS it can clearly assist you with managing tailings facilities. Imagery and remote sensing is really critical to this, and the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World provides ready-to-use data and applications to get started. Oftentimes, though, you'll need to use third-party data or proprietary data uh, and analysis workflows that you might create yourselves that require um, you to go far beyond what's available within Living Atlas. So this is where the rest of ArcGIS and that entire platform that Caroline showed us can help. So from here, I want to go show you now how we can use ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online to help perform some of those more advanced workflows. ArcGIS Pro, which is what I've just opened here, comes with a robust set of tools for analyzing remote sensing data. We support hundreds of platforms, formats, and sources of data. And so I want to show you how we can do a very similar water content analysis for a tailings facility, but with a much higher revisit rate using daily imagery. Esri business partner, Planet, has developed an add-in to ArcGIS Pro, which allows you to quickly access their vast collection of imagery. To find recent imagery, all I need to do is open up their image search tool, provide my current map extent as my area of interest, and then I can apply a series of filters for example, on a date range, as well as the source, so the constellation that we'd be receiving this data from. I'm gonna use the PlanetScope four band source, which has approximately a three to four meter ground sample distance or spatial resolution, but a very high temporal resolution with nearly daily global coverage. I can also filter by cloud cover, which I'll do 
and a number of other filters available. At that point, all I need to do is press search, and in a matter of seconds, I'll find a list of all available imagery that meets my criteria. I can find imagery as recently as January 25th that fit those criteria, and I can select any of these dates and quickly, rapidly add these to my maps. Going back and looking at historical data, I'll also go grab some data from January 3rd, for example, and add that as well. And in ArcGIS Pro, using a similar swiping tool as what we used before, I can swipe between these two very recent images and see how things have changed. Again, with new uh, deposition up here in the northwest and with the pond outline changing. So this is really useful for visual inspection and analysis. Um, you can have you know, literally day-old satellite imagery available at your fingertips in seconds. And for tailings management, this is critical because your operations are constantly changing and in flux day to day. If I wanted to run more advanced analysis though, go beyond just visually looking at this, what I can do within Planet's application is I can order the imagery that I've selected. Upon selecting place order, Planet will receive that, process it, and send me a link to download it again completely through ArcGIS Pro, where I can go to the order status, select download. Planet even makes it possible for you to task satellites within ArcGIS Pro by providing an AOI and in turn receiving 50 centimeter SkySat imagery when and where you need it. So I've already gone ahead and downloaded this imagery. So I'm going to go over to my next map and show you how we can do this analysis workflow with the image analyst extension for ArcGIS Pro. I want to create a full workflow for delineating the pond outline so that I can include this as an analysis in my daily or weekly reports. So first step is to create a way to automatically classify this imagery. To do this, I'm going to use some of the machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms available within our segmentation and classification toolbox. In particular, I'll be using the train support vector machine or SVM classifier. The SVM algorithm is a supervised learning model, which means that it requires you to provide some training samples that you can use then to build a model to classify subsequent imagery. In ArcGIS Pro, we've got this training samples manager. And in here, you're able to digitize your training samples to provide as an input. The first thing that you do is you create a schema. So here, I've got various train types that I see in my image, like the water, which I'm interested in detecting, as well as developed land for urban development, barren for some of this uh, exposed earth, mine for uh, the mine area, and then dry for dry sections of the tailings facility. To digitize these different trains, all I need to do is select the train type and draw a boundary around what I'm interested in detecting. And likewise, I can do the same thing for the dry area. Now, that was a sort of um, rough approximation of what you would want to draw around. But upon completing that, all you need to do is run the train support vector machine classifier where your input is the raster data set and your training samples. This will create a model for you, which you can then apply in the inferencing tool, which is classify raster. Here you'll provide your input data set and any subsequent data that you might collect or use and your input model. The output of this analysis is going to be a classified image. So if I turn on my output, we'll see in blue the water, <clears throat> and in yellow, that dry area. This data set, though, can be filtered down to remove all the unnecessary information. So really just pulling out the area where there's water. And we can begin to layer in some of the similar information that we saw earlier, right? Those distances from the crest. Now, over time, the benefit of using this planet imagery in the machine learning model is that you can do this on a nearly daily basis. And as you do that, you capture very, um, a very large amount of outlines, in this case, of this pond. 
which we can see here, visualized with the more recent ones being these darker colors. And so you can see how it's been growing. And this time data you can use to create charts, as well as an ArcGIS Pro, visualized as a time enabled layer. So both the imagery and the pond outlines are time enabled, allowing me to animate these to explore trends and patterns over time. The last thing I'll show you here with this same data set is that everything is 3D ready. These data sets that we create can be visualized then in three dimensions to help under users, again, get more context of this data. As long as you have those elevation models, in this case, using one coming from ArcGIS Living Atlas, you can create these types of visualizations. But you can certainly also bring in your own data, whether it's LiDAR, drone-based, or uh, other sources. So just to summarize this workflow, uh, before we look at the last one, you know, the benefits of applying workflow like this is that you can automate this from beginning to end. And by applying it, you can reduce any kind of manual digitizing or ground-based observation workflows and optimize your water management processes. And this can be applied to other things that you might want to observe, like seepage on an impoundment, vegetation, and more. Aside from water management, though, remote sensing can also be used for monitoring topography, such as erosion, uh, slope assessments, and more. So this last workflow that we're going to look at is using drone imagery to monitor similar uh, to monitor changes in the topography. Drones provide the ability for you to inspect very difficult to reach areas often with the potential for very high revisit times and really small ground sampling distances. This helps you to observe more and more minute changes in the terrain. This example is from an open pit mine, but the analysis is directly applicable to tailings workflows. This flight that we're looking at here was processed using site scan for ArcGIS, as well as flown using uh, site scan for ArcGIS. That uh, site scan is a cloud-based drone processing software, and we covered this in a past mining webinar if you'd like to learn a bit more. What I've done though from this application is I've downloaded these in imagery products, things like my ortho mosaics, my digital elevation models, and more, to go do some further analysis within Pro. In our Pro, you can see that ortho mosaic that we were just looking at in site scan. And I've also got two digital elevation models for two different dates, November 12th and June 26th. Now, initially looking at these elevation models, uh, they're not very useful for visualization by themselves. Instead, we need to create derivative products from them, such as hill shades. I can use the raster functions within ArcGIS Pro to achieve this. Raster functions are operations that dynamically apply processing to your source raster data set as opposed to what uh, traditionally may have been done, which was writing new data to disk. So this makes them very performant because they only process data at your current map extent. So uh, choosing from the dozens of raster functions that are available, I can find the hillshade one, provide my digital elevation model as an input and select create new layer. And in just about a second, I've already created my output data set. Raster functions are not only highly performant, but they're also extremely extensible. So you can create your own raster functions to process your imagery however you'd like to. Now, I've already created one for the other data set that we were looking at. If I zoom in, now my digital elevation models, I can really start to make sense of them and see visually changes that have occurred. For monitoring chains of tailings facilities, drones and these types of visualization capabilities provide new and innovative ways for you to perform inspections safely and comprehensively. If we wanted to quantify these changes though and go beyond just visually looking at them, we'll want to use the raster calculator tool, another tool that's available within ArcGIS Pro. Raster calculator essentially allows you to perform algebra on your rasters on a pixel by pixel basis. What that means is I can take my digital elevation model from June 26th and subtract it from November 12th. And the output result will show me positive values where the elevation has increased and negative values where that elevation has decreased. 
I'll go ahead and turn on the output of that, and we'll be able to see what that looks like. So in black is where the most, the highest values for material having been removed or the elevation decreasing is highlighted again in black. Uh, and I can apply a different set of symbology to this to highlight, make it more user friendly in red in this case, where that most significant um, elevation change has occurred. Then the last thing I'll do here is turn on a profile graph that we've created. So I drew a profile across the two digital elevation models. And using the embedded graphing tools within ArcGIS Pro, I can visualize how those two digital elevation models compare on that exact same transect. And just like the water content one that we were looking at a moment ago, everything is readily visualized within 3D. So just to summarize, all this example is really for the inside of the pit that we looked at. You can definitely apply the same process to a tailing storage facility to monitor for things like erosion and other topographic changes. Overall, what we've looked at is some content capabilities in the Living Atlas and some analysis capabilities here within Pro. Uh, and ArcGIS Pro really is a key part of any imagery and remote sensing workflow within the ArcGIS platform. And as you saw, it can be applied to water management, geotechnical monitoring, and much more. Ultimately, though, everything that's done here by perhaps an analyst uh, or a power user is done to guide others to make better decisions. And a key part of that is making sure that everything I make in here is accessible to others uh, in an easy to use and consumable way. So to wrap up everything in this demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can use ArcGIS to manage and share all this data and information with others through WebGIS. So first, many of you might be familiar with the sharing capabilities within ArcGIS Pro. Any map that you make, any data set that you create can be shared as a web layer or as a web map. And in the case of imagery, those images can be shared as image services to ArcGIS image server. Uh, if I wanted to share this map, all I have to do is click Share Web Map, give it a name, summary, and tags, and press Share. What I want to show you, though, that's new in coming to ArcGIS Online this year is a new software as a service offering with the equivalent capabilities as ArcGIS Image Server. This will allow you to manage and analyze your raster data from a completely cloud hosted solution. Using ArcGIS Online imagery is as easy as selecting Create in new imagery layer. First, I'll have the option of choosing from two types, either an imagery layer, which is for rapid visualization, or a dynamic imagery layer. For today, I'll use a dynamic imagery layer. And then I get to choose from a variety of different configurations, such as the image collection, which dynamically mosaics multiple images together. For those of you familiar with mosaic data sets, this is an equivalent function. From here, all I need to do is provide my imagery by dragging it over into the browser and specifying my imagery type. At this point, I'll give my imagery a name. And select create. In a matter of minutes, you'll have a web based image service ready to use that can be embedded into web maps as well as used as well as used in things like ArcGIS Pro, which I can see here. So the power of this is that, you know, traditionally many people would manage data uh, oftentimes locally, for example, um, and giving users access to uh, all of the capabilities of imagery sometimes required powerful desktop software, required users to have specific applications, but now any imagery that you manage can be shared to the web and given to others uh, to be consumed and visualized. And you don't need extensive on-premise infrastructure can be done in the ArcGIS cloud. And this isn't limited, of course, to 2D. To, uh, 2D. If we go back and look at that OpenPit example, similar uh, visualizations can be created to visualize that exact same data in a web-based application. So 
To recap everything that we've seen, the ArcGIS Living Alice of the world gives ready-to-use remote sensing content and analytical tools that you can start to use today in your day-to-day -day workflows. ArcGIS Pro in the image, image analyst extension is a powerful tool to derive insights from virtually any source of imagery or raster data. And whether that's from business partners like uh, Planet or from drone imagery that you've processed with SiteScan for ArcGIS, anything, uh, virtually any source of remote sensing data can be supported. Finally, you can share all of your data and insights and integrate multiple tailings monitoring workflows from mobile, IoT, to Im and imagery into comprehensive dashboards to remotely monitor the health and safety of your operations. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back over to Darren, who's gonna wrap up the webinar. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. We have got some questions uh, that have come through and uh, we've got some, some time to go through it. Um, first one I have, Matt, I'll, I'll, I'll direct it to yourself. Uh, is how do I get access to the Living Atlas data? Yeah, uh, so the ArcGIS Living Atlas is a um, a collection of content that any user in ArcGIS Online has access to visualize. So it comes with your ArcGIS Online subscriptions. Um, and depending on which data source you need in there, uh, some of them just come with your subscription, some of them have a credit cost associated with them, but Essentially, any ArcGIS Online user has access to them. Okay, great. Um, this one for, for Caroline. Uh, will ArcGIS Online imagery replace Image Server? Uh, it will not. So Image Server uh, remains. Um, it, it's been a very powerful way to, to process and share large collections of data. It fits the needs for many of our, our larger organizations. Um, in, in sharing um, the new ArcGIS Online Image Services is is just an, another way to to do some of the same thing. So it's it, at Esri we're all about options, and um, ArcGIS Online Image Services is, is a new option for for um, as Matt showed for sharing all of your imagery data uh, without the need to invest in um, in hardware and infrastructure. Okay, great. Uh, also, Caroline, back to you on Planet Imagery. Uh, how can I get the Planet Imagery add-in for Pro? So th that is available for download. You do need to be a subscriber to um, to the Planet Imagery um, services uh, in order to to have it work. So uh, this is not a um, a search and discovery tool for for one-off data sets. You you do need to be a a subscriber, uh, and you are bound to um, uh, Planet's licensing um, around how you use the imagery. But um, through the plugin, we're providing a very convenient way for our, our users, as Matt showed, within um, you know within one frame essentially to um, to use your subscription and to use it in uh, in the Esri platform. Okay, excellent. And Matt, um, I think this will probably be for you. What kind of accuracy are you getting with the, dr the drone change detection workflow? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, with, with that specific data set, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can say that you know, it, it's highly variable depending on you know things like the altitude that you fly at, whether you use ground control points, um, the type of camera and, and the resolution of data that you're capturing. There's quite a few parameters. Um, and some of that analysis of the accuracy is included in the output products of drone processing software like SightScan. So you can go in there and, and analyze what accuracy you could expect to be getting. Um, ultimately, though, everything uh, is great to ground truth so you can see because there's just so many variables with it. So um, highly variable and hard to answer, but that's overview of how you might consider what's, uh, what accuracy you're getting. Okay. And one around radar and LIDAR data. So can you process radar and LIDAR data? And can I use this, that type of data in ArcGIS for tailings? So um, I'll field that one, Darren. Uh, currently, um, 
we have image processing capabilities uh, on the platform um, and, and very good tool sets for, um, for LIDAR, but not processing. We also are just starting to look at um, radar tool sets. Um, again, both LIDAR and, and radar uh, processing engines are, are quite intense, and um, uh, we do not have that embedded um, as, of, as of now. Uh, but I would encourage anybody to, to use the LAS tool set in Pro and explore what you can do with your point clouds and um, also uh, to look at um, what we can do with synthetic aperture radar and interferometric radar, especially in terms of deformation uh, for our mining customers. Okay, and I don't know, Matt or Caroline, who would feel this, but how many credits will the imagery service on AGOL or ArcGIS Online consume? Do we have a sense of that, or is that something you can? I, yep, I can speak to it. So uh, it, it does consume credits. That's the model that we will be going forward with these new services. Um, it's going to depend on the interactivity with your pixels. So uh, if you recall, the, I, I showed a slide with the different options, uh, starting with basic storage, where you really just need a place to park your, your imagery data. And then you move up the line. Um, so credits consumed are going to be based on um, really what you, what you decide to do with your data, all the way up to deep analysis. Uh, so it's going to be a, cons a credit consumption model. And how much really is dependent on uh, what functions you require. OK. And is there any ground movement analysis and alarming based on movement thresholds with some of the available tools? Yeah, I think I could take that one. Um, I think so any of the analysis tools that you use they might drive a product that uh, summarizes ground movement for example and you could set thresholds in your analysis workflow to say highlight when it goes beyond a certain threshold right uh, to highlight issues that are of interest to you sort of like what we did with the water detection so setting those thresholds is something you can absolutely do in the analysis and um, and then visualize in, for example, those dashboards within ArcGIS Pro, um, or even send notifications in some cases, depending on the workflow. Um, so yes, that is something that you can do. Okay. And question on how effective is this when the surface is snow covered? Not sure the full context of that. But did you want to take that one, Caroline, or do you want me to try? Uh, maybe we tag team it. I, I would say, you know, uh, in terms of remote sensing, obviously um, snow and, and does create some, some issues in terms of um, gauging your accuracies. Um, there, there are remote sensing techniques using things like radar data that overcome overcome that. Um, so, like, like there, there are a lot of parameters, I guess, around around. Uh, answering that question. Um, Matt, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I, I think you hit on it there. Just using, uh, there are some alternatives out there. Uh, In-ground yeah. in um, instrumentation and, and radar. From a remote sensing perspective, um, there, there are different sensors that sort of overcome um, that, that snow layer issue. OK. There's, there's a bit of a loaded question here, and I don't know um, question is, what could have been done differently, monitoring-wise, to avoid the Brazil tailings dam failure? Um, I think I'm going to take the position of you're responsible. We don't, we don't understand all that was play. I mean, we know, you know, we know what the uh, the result was of the immense amount of rain and everything else. But I think, you know, if you look at the webinar as a whole, it's just talking about well, what are the things that you could do to uh, obviously mitigate as much risk as you can. And um, yeah, I think it'd be irresponsible for us to to comment further than that. I don't know, Caroline uh, or Matt, anything further on that? No, I, I agree. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I don't want to speak to the specifics of that incident, but like you said, it, these technologies for monitoring are designed to help anticipate potential issues in um, are being implemented around the world. and. Uh, to help with that. And so I think that, that's really the goal here. 
I, I would just say um, that what, what we're providing here is um, a visualization and analysis um, platform that, that enhances other, other sensors that you may have uh, in place. It, it doesn't necessarily replace everything. Um, again, the, the whole idea is to provide a common operating picture uh, that assists with your operations, but is, is not a substitute in some cases for, um, for, for what you're already doing. Okay, great. And there's a couple questions, and I'll, I'll use this as kind of uh, finishing things up. Uh, was around, you know, where are the other webinars or the part one of this series? And so if you see here, the, uh, the link here is to all of our webinars. And in there, you'll find the uh, the first of these two. Um, but by all means, you know, if there's any questions related to this webinar, be sure to reach out to to any of us on this list here, myself, Matt, or Caroline, or anybody that you might have uh, locally uh, where you're operating. Uh, we also encourage you to join and participate in the MUG, as, as I mentioned earlier, and, and sign up on our GeoNet forum. And that's where you'll also find some of the webinars that are available on YouTube. Um, with that, I'd also like to thank everybody for your interest and participation. I really appreciate if you might take a few minutes at the conclusion of this uh, and take that survey uh, that'll come up. Uh, this is really going to help us kind of um, take whatever relevant topics are and, and where you're operating and, and maybe we can, you know, tee those up for future webinars. And uh, with that, we look forward to uh, seeing you up for the next webinar. And uh, please continue to be safe and, and take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.